Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Conversation Projects webinar, Bring Advanced Care Conversations to Your Congregation. My name is Naomi Fedna, and I'm the project coordinator for the Conversation Project, and we'll be starting in just a few minutes.
Hi everyone, happy Tuesday and welcome to the Conversation Projects webinar, bringing advanced care conversations to your congregation. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. We're really excited to continue this um, webinar series and to continue to bring the Conversation Project to you and to your congregations. Um, my name is Naomi Fedna um, and I will be your WebEx host today. While we're waiting for everyone to join us, I'd like to run through a few WebEx tips and tricks. If you have any questions or comments at any point during the call, feel free to type it into the chat box at the bottom of your screen and send it to all participants. You can also use the raise your hand icon, which is located on the right hand side, and we'll be able to call on you to voice your question or if you have a comment that you'd like to share. And if you're having any technical difficulties, please chat specifically to the host and I'll receive the message privately and I'll be able to help you out. So before we dive right in, we want to know where people are joining us from today. We know there are some folks calling in from all over the country and really interested to see where folks are located. So to get a sense of where everyone is, please point to where you're calling from on the map. And so to do this, use the arrow key in the upper left hand corner of your screen, right above the WebEx presentation you're currently viewing. Click the arrow key and then click on the map where you're located. Great, we have some folks from New Mexico, Oklahoma, South Carolina. Awesome, Nebraska. Wonderful, it looks like we've got a great group of people with us today. So if you didn't get a chance to put your error on the map, please continue to type your location into the chat box because we really are interested in learning a little bit more about where people are calling from today. And with that, I'm going to pass to you, Rosemary, and you can take it away. Thank you, Naomi. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to our webinar on bringing advanced care planning conversations to your congregation. Today, we'll be diving into ways that sermons, preaching, and teaching can create a strong foundation for infusing these crucial conversations and practical spirituality into the life and work of your community. I hope that you're finding the information we're sharing on this webinar and in the Getting Started in Congregations Guide, which you can download for free from our website at theconversationproject.org, we hope you find that useful. We are a learning organization and welcome your feedback on the content and the delivery so that we can improve our teaching. At the end of this session, a brief survey will pop up when you close out of WebEx. Last week, there was a technical glitch and you weren't able to complete the survey, so we have repaired that link and hope that you will take two minutes to complete this week's evaluation. Thank you so much. So our aims for what we hope you'll take away from this session include some insight into the key value of sermons in supporting advanced care planning conversations in your community, texts and ideas for grounding a sermon on crucial conversations about one's wishes for end-of-life care. We hope we'll have some shared ideas for themes that could be used in various liturgical calendars, and of course, we hope that you will be motivated to invite your faith leaders to participate in Conversation Sabbath. You'll learn more about that during this call. So in the next 15 minutes, we will ask you to share any burning questions that arose from last session about setting goals for your work. Please use the chat and we will do our best to weave answers into this session or reply to them via the follow-up email that will be sent out by Thursday. The other items on our agenda include why sermons matter, texts and timing, stories from the field, we'll talk a little bit about Conversation Sabbath 2018, and we will make more time for your questions uh, at the end of this session. So let's just dive in. So again, if you have a question that arose out of the content from last week that we discussed about building a team, setting an aim, 
engaging senior clergy, or assessing your congregation, please enter it into the chat. And we will try and weave some answers into tonight's presentation. Anticipating one issue that you may have questions about, I want to pause to clarify some details about the successful program at St. John the Evangelist Roman Catholic Church in Columbia, Maryland. During the last session, Audrey Marsh shared some of the amazing successes their new lay-led clergy-approved ministry has achieved. A number of people were struck when Audrey said, told us about the sheer number of people who turned out for their programs. So I want to just give some additional perspective on their success. So what Audrey told us about was that when they tallied their attendance for their events, uh, she used the number 900 and that kind of blew a lot of us away when we were talking about starting small. They had 900 participants at five events that they held over six months for their congregation. These events happened after six months of intensive planning. What Audrey clarified with me is that that 900 figure is not all unique participants. So some of those people attended more than one event and they were counted twice. It's also helpful to know that St. John the Evangelist Church has 3,000 members in its congregation, so they're already drawing from a very large pool of possible participants. Over the course of the six months, they held five programs. They held three conversation starter kit workshops and hosted two panels. I uh, will hear more about those panels when Audrey joins us for a future call. What was still outstanding is that their attendance was very high at each of their events. For their conversation starter kit workshops, they had between 100 and 150 people at each of the workshops. That's pretty amazing. And at their panels, they had between 200 and 350 people at their events. One of the things that St. John's also was sure to do was to have follow-up evaluations and also to uh, assess what kind of difference did any of these programs make. They found in doing a survey a few weeks later that 50% of the attendees at these events self-reported that they completed their health care proxies and 20, an additional 25% self-reported that they were, quote, working on them. I know some people are especially interested in learning from our stories from the field, so we'll be bringing Audrey back to webinar session five on programming in two weeks. I hope this is helpful clarification for people who were pretty amazed. I also want to thank Audrey again because uh, she was she generously shared her trifold brochure on the ministry they created at St. John the Evangelist called Your Gift of Peace, and we attach that in the follow-up email to session two. So thanks again, folks, for generously sharing the product of your thorough planning, implementation, and testing. I know we'll all benefit from it. Now, when Audrey and her team first began considering how to bring advanced care planning conversations into their community, they learned, as you will tonight, that change takes place because people decide to take action. What action do you want to take? From our investigation of what leads to meaningful change in congregations, the Conversation Project has distilled the ideas that can be tried into three pockets of key activities that are common to many congregations. That includes sermons, pastoral care, and programming. Today, we'll focus on sermons. Now, sermons is the word we are using to refer to those talks that are delivered generally, but not always, by a recognized faith leader to their congregation. While sermons or Dharma talks or drosh are often used to explain sacred texts, they are also designed to create change, change in how people think, feel, 
and act. Change in people as individuals, as part of institutions, and in society. Sermons matter as a, an activity for change because they reach people in a familiar setting on a regular basis. They are very often, oops, sorry. They are very often the key element of a weekly service and herald a message that the spiritual leader thinks and feels is important for their community to hear collectively. For a topic like talking about one's end of life care wishes or reflecting on mortality or the value of completing a health care proxy form or appointing a durable power of attorney for health care, a sermon is tantamount to an endorsement that these are valid topics to be considered within the framework of faith, ethics, beliefs, and practices. It's also an encouragement to undertake these conversations as practical and spiritual course. And since many people gather in their worship settings on a weekly basis or a regular basis, a congregational setting provides an opportunity for a feedback loop, a chance to ask questions, gain clarity, seek support or more information, find conversation partners, and offer help to others. In my vernacular or tradition, I can say that the topic of what matters most preaches. It's a topic with universal application. It's a topic that requires theological or ethical grounding and guidance. It also employs storytelling. Like so many topics that are addressed within congregations, the idea of what matters most or advanced care planning or serious illness needs to be revisited on a regular basis because people are prepared to hear the topic at different points in time. We know that a sermon can be offered on forgiveness at a time when that seed may not fall into fertile ground, but that's why we come back and we revisit that topic on a regular basis, not every week, not every month, but certainly in the course of a year or every two years, these topics need to come back. And although this is a tender topic, it provides an opportunity for the person who's offering the sermon to address vital, inspiring, and transformational matters, and what could be better for sermon than that. Some of the things that I think can be included and rolled into these kinds of sermons are ones that focus on things like forgiveness, love, gratitude, values, right relations, all the things that we want to be talking about inside of our communities on a regular basis and how they connect to this end of life care or what matters most or advanced care planning. Well, that is the work for the, the sermon writer to mine and bring back to the surface for the people who are listening. So what are some of the texts or themes that could ground a sermon or be woven into a sermon about end of life care wishes, advanced care planning, and having conversations about these matters with friends and family and health care providers. Last week we shared this slide in talking about ways that we integrate this, this topic. From all of our traditions there are texts to be um, lifted up and here are just a few that seem to jump right to mind uh, for a lot of people. Honor your father and mother from Exodus. From the Quran, treat your parents kindly and with humility. And the first principle of the Unitarian Universalist Association, we affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person. So it invites the kinds of questions that need to be asked in a sermon on a topic 
of the, on this theme, questions like how do we honor or treat kindly or uphold dignity without having important conversations about living and dying. That's something that we could explore in a sermon. Now, one of the assignments we suggested last time was inviting you to identify three texts that you thought could be used in a subject-related sermon. What are the texts that you came up with? If you had time to do that, we invite you to enter the name of the article or the um, story or the poem or the citation in the chat right now. That way we can crowdsource some ideas too. We'll compile your suggestions and send out the list in a follow-up email. So I'll just give people a moment to chat in if they have some thoughts about text. And while I'm waiting, I'll just note that Ronnie Genser has some questions about uh, St. John's as part of the planning process, how many committees were formed, how many total volunteers were there, what was the average age of the seminar participants. Ronnie, I'm going to take those questions back to Audrey so that when she comes back to talk to us about programming in two weeks, she can address those questions. Thanks for asking. Thanks, Ted is starting to chat in some ideas from Genesis in the Hebrew Bible and John in the Christian Bible, another Christian text in Romans and Luke. Beautiful. I also found one from Genesis. Uh, this is a pretty important and classic text that's used often at the end of the year, the story of the death of Jacob. Gather around so I can tell you what will happen to you in the days to come. And when Jacob had finished giving instructions to his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. There's a lot more in between those, uh, those phrases. Um, Take a look and see if there isn't something there for you to use as well. Thematically, there are questions of courage, have, not having fear, being faithful. Do we have the courage to talk about living and dying in what seems to be a death avoidant question? Are we willing to contemplate that unwanted interventions at the end of life may inflict harm and violence? In many religious traditions, the idea of do no harm, peaceful, being peaceful, nonviolent to one another, is a very important theme. Is there the possibility that harm can be done if people receive care that they might not have wanted if they thought they could express that wish? How can we surface those conversations and those wishes unless we invite them? Personally, I believe that this is a topic that can be woven into stewardship, into sermons on justice, and topics of compassion. Questions about how we can integrate our values, faith, and ethics as we consider decisions for care at the end of life. And of course, we don't have to draw only from biblical or sacred texts, I should say. Um, I have often used other texts. Poetry is a wonderful source uh, to be woven into a sermon on a topic related to advanced care planning. There are many, but I just lifted up two of my favorites here, a poem by Mary Oliver called When Death Comes. And we have some links at the beginning of this chat where you can find uh, a number of these references. A poem by Jane Kenyon called Otherwise, which just contemplates, um, she's contemplating her own diagnosis of leukemia 
and appreciating the beauty of the everyday, knowing against a background of serious life-limiting illness how precious each thing is, from getting up in the morning on legs that still carry her, to walk up a hill and walk the dog, to eat fresh fruit and drink milk, see flowers and candles, be with her partner. These kinds of contemplations of the level of gratitude we can have every moment when we cultivate a subtle day-to-day awareness of our mortality, that's a topic, I think, that preaches. Song lyrics are also possibilities. Uh, one that one of my colleagues integrated into a sermon he gave for Conversation Sabbath one year was the Phil Oaks song, When I'm Gone, and we'll be seeing some of those lyrics at the end of this presentation. And of course, stories. Stories from many cultures, many traditions, many faiths uh, are available for us to, to draw from. Again, we've put some links at the beginning of this chat for stories like the story of the mustard seed in Kisa Gotami, in which a woman whose son has died, whose child has died, goes to the Buddha and asks him to bring her son back to life. And he says, directs her to go find a mustard seed from a household where there's never been death. And of course, you can imagine as she went to seek that she never did find anyone whose household had been untouched. We all have a story. If you don't know the appointment at Samara, I encourage you to click on that link and take a read. It'll give you a little chill up your spine. It's a short, very short story with a twist ending. And a beautiful um, traditional story from the Jewish tradition about the rabbi and his housekeeper. And this has a link that connects to a sermon by Rabbi Carl Perkins, who incorporated it into his sermon. And you can see how that's done. And on our website, where we have sample sermons, you are welcome, uh, with permission from all of the writers, to draw on those sermons, uh, to piece together another sermon, to use it, lift it entirely, uh, as long as you give credit, but to have at least an idea of how different people approach this topic. I th hope it's a helpful reference for all of you. So when could you preach on this topic? Well, one of the ideas that we had was to really try and encourage lots of people to do it all at once. And we've created a campaign called Conversation Sabbath. It's a simple idea. We invite clergy leaders throughout the country to preach or teach about the vital importance of having these value-centered conversations with our loved ones about what matters most when it comes to care at the end of life. Imagine hundreds of congregations talking about these intimate vital matters during one week in the fall. Our hope is it just might spark a national conversation. During Conversation Sabbath, you can share your faith's teaching on this critical topic and encourage your congregants to talk in a familiar setting about what matters most to them and not wait for a medical crisis in the ICU. I'm just going to pause because we have a, an entry into our chat, which if you're on the phone, you may not see. And I just want to take note of it, thanks to uh, Rabbi Fred Klein. And it's another story about Rabbi Judah who was dying and the other rabbis came to pray around him. Great, this is a wonderful summary of this story in a very short way. Thanks for uh, sharing that with us, Fred. Appreciate it. We'll make sure everyone gets it on the follow-up email as well. Now, the impact of a sermon can be immediate or it can have a ripple effect over time. We have seen a sermon on the importance of having a conversation with the people closest to fortify attendance at an upcoming workshop or panel. So it's a very special announcement. It's like a deep in integrated announcement on why we want to go take action, right? These sermons are designed to help change people by having them take new actions. I've seen families begin to have conversations they've been too nervous or reluctant to start at coffee hour 
or as they were leaving together, and tell us later on about the relief they felt now that they finally were talking openly about such an important topic. But one of my favorite stories about the impact of a sermon on someone in the congregation comes from Rabbi Esther Adler at Mount Zion Temple in St. Paul, Minnesota. She preached during Yom Kippur in 2017, which is the time that she chose to address her congregation because, as she said, it's when we have our largest attendance and I want to reach as many people as possible. And it involves the rabbi and the doctor, Dr. Jeff Dichter, who is an ICU medical director in a, uh, at a hospital in St. Paul. What happened? Well, Esther, uh, Rabbi Adler preached about the importance of having a conversation. And the impact on Dr. Dichter was so impressive that he wrote her a note of thanks. And he wrote, it routinely makes me hurt inside when patients and family are admitted to an ICU, as most have rarely, if ever considered, what care they truly want or not. It is heartbreaking to try and help them assimilate it all, and all too frequently, decisions are left for families with leftover feelings that may linger for years. As healthcare professionals, he wrote, we sometimes wonder Aren't there others in society who might help all of us consider these things ahead of time? Well, he said, you did this in a highly sophisticated yet understandable way. Your words were both educational and sensitive, and your message was precious. Talk about it with your loved ones when you are well and let them know how you would feel and what your wishes would be if you were very sick. He said to his rabbi, I would encourage you to give this talk as often as practical to as many audiences as possible, as it is caring for all in very important ways, which may not be fully appreciated until the time comes. The ideas the idea that the words of a sermon can change thinking, feeling, and acting in people, institutions, and society is not only theoretical. Dr. Dichter and so many clinicians and professionals and family caregivers are upheld and encouraged to hear from their trusted spiritual leaders that talking matters. That it's a gift we give those we love and those who care for us. So. Conversation Sabbath is one way to help inspire support clergy to offer sermons. If conversation dates, Sabbath dates, don't fit with your liturgical cycle, that's not a problem. Simply choose dates or the holy seasons that suit your community. For example, Conversation Sabbath was held in San Francisco two weeks ago. They had 13 diverse congregations that signed up and participated and influenced so many people in one day. Cleveland is looking to hold Conversation Sabbath in mid-October, while organizers in New York City are planning conversation with our national campaign dates, which are October 27th to November 5th. You can register your congregation through a link on our webpage, and we'll include the registration link in the chat and we'll share it in our follow-up email as well. Registering just lets us know how many people are participating and it helps us to develop a campaign, a media campaign that communicates with a wide swath across the country. This is a conversation people are ready to have. So, to get into action and make a change that will increase advanced care planning conversations in your community, there are some great ways to get started using the idea, the pocket of activity of sermons. As we just talked about, you can write and deliver a sermon on why talking matters during Conversation Sabbath, adding a call to action for people to have the conversation with their loved ones. To prepare for that sermon, clergy or a lay team 
could brainstorm to identify preaching themes and supporting texts to ground and guide the sermon on a topic that touches us all. The theme could be on aging well and wisely. It could be on caregiving or being a caregiver. It could be on your ethics of your tradition. It could be on suffering. There are many ways to weave this. A worship committee or deacons or other lay committee that helps could offer to help plan and implement a thematically integrated intergenerational worship service that addresses the importance of having the conversation. Just last Sunday, I was with a humanist Jewish community in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where a group of lay leaders wove lots of joyful singing about life into the service. They included songs from Fiddler on the Roof to Bob Dylan. And that was all what they did to help prepare for introducing me to offer a guide on the Conversation Starter Kit. It was a great service. People were very animated and very, very excited to be doing this in a positive way, in a celebratory way, not in a mordant way. With a team or on your own, you might work on identifying times in the liturgical year when a service with a conversation or death and dying or planning a head theme would have integrity. I'd be interested from your perspective, uh, what are some of the times of year that would work for you? If you have a chance or have a thought, please type into the chat. We've seen Advent and Lent come up often in the Christian faith as these are times of preparation. Yom Kippur in the Jewish tradition, a time of renewal, and repentance, thinking about death, thinking about life, thinking about renewal. What are more seasonal times like that? Great, Ted Karp is sharing Day of the Dead, All Saints and All Souls in early November. Lent, thanks Betty. Could this work as part of New Year's resolutions? What about Mother's or Father's Day? Maybe not your traditional theme, but it's certainly a legacy sermon that could be given. Oh, great. National Healthcare Decisions Day. I love that. In fact, I was thinking about how um, for the chaplains on uh, the call, especially, that this could be an outreach program for National Healthcare Decisions Day that to offer to go and, and guest, guest preach on that topic and linking in healthcare. Stewardship season. Yeah, talking about last things and the stewarding of human resources. And Margaret Montori says, before the holidays when families will be gathering, absolutely, we love that. Thanksgiving, any other major holidays where people are gathering. Get people ready to be talking about this and give them the grounding for having that conversation and the courage to be brave and bring it up. You know, it's a lot easier to say, you know, when I was at school or I was at church or I was with my sangha, we talked about this and we said how important it is and I really want to bring this back into our family life as well. Thinking about Ted's comment about stewardship season, I had one colleague tell me that their congregation was about to engage in a fundraising drive and he would be talking about leaving a bequest to the church. And then it dawned on him, I can't ask folks to leave us money in their wills without reminding them that they're going to die. <laughs> so I better prepare them with that sermon first. And he did. And it was useful and meaningful because people wanted to think about legacy and what matters most to them. And if this spiritual community means a lot to you, is important to you, matters to you, then this is a way to integrate that not as just a, 
well, you're going to die, leave us some money. But, you know, really, what is this grounded in? It's grounded in your values and what matters most. So people can also prepare a list of texts, readings, poems, and even hymns that could be used in a service during conversation Sabbath or whenever you choose to preach a sermon, recognizing that there are elements of celebration to be incorporated. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I think it's worth celebrating that we, as people of faith, are prepared to talk about a topic that touches us all, that we want to clarify what we value most in life, that we have a certain readiness to share our wishes for care through the end of life with our loved ones, and that we want to ground our conversations about the kind of care we want in our values and in our faith. We also know that stories matter so much. So as part of a service, you may want to think about identifying members of the congregation who would be prepared to testify or tell a story during a service about the challenge or blessing of having the conversation and the difference it made. And nothing tells is a better story than when you speak of your own story about an experience of a heart or a good death and what it taught you. Um, we have, uh, Audrey also mentioned the priests in her community. They have three priests in their large congregation. And when they chose to do this, they decided that each one of them would preach at one of the three services. And it was almost like a competition among them. But in it, they uh, who could preach the best best sermon? But it was also this idea that um, they told their own stories and things that they had experienced and why this actually mattered to them and why now they were talking with their entire congregation so that people would either have the benefit that they had or avoid the not so great situation because conversations had been avoided or just omitted up until that time. So I want to just take a pause now and see if people have any questions about um, what we've been talking about tonight. Or if you have questions from a previous call, please chat them in now. Now we will have to get some music in the background for next time so we can just hold a little silence and uh, give people an opportunity to chat in their questions. Can you imagine that there would be obstacles to having offering a sermon like this? Would it be challenging in your setting to bring it up? Have you heard a sermon on this topic in your setting or offered one? How did it go? Can we show the slide of the stories? I missed the rabbi one and the one above it. Um, I think if you, uh, let's see who is asking me that. Hang on. Catherine, if you slide uh, your cursor, um, if you go all the way up to the top of the chat using the bar on the right of the chat box and go all the way back to the top, you will find the um, the references for each of those stories. And I will also see if I can go back for you. Here you go. While well, well, we're looking at the other questions, I hope you can see that. The story of the mustard seed, appointment at Samara, and the rabbi and his housekeeper. 
Bob is asking, is there a target age that we should statistically be considering for participants? Well, I'll tell you, Bob, I think that there's a, this is a, a topic that suits all ages. And we are finding that our, the bulk, the majority of our attendees are women 55 to 75. That's who seems to naturally come to these um, after service or during the week programs. And we are hearing more and more from congregations that are doing intentionally reaching younger audiences by scheduling them at times when they would come. For example, if you're wanting to target um, parents of young children, you would do it at a time when there was still childcare available after a service, for example. We know that there are groups that have been targeting young adults in particular. So it's specifically for young adults and maybe even is co-facilitated by another young adult that you have on your team. When we talked about forming your teams, we encourage people to think about having diversity on your team in age and gender, uh, all kinds of things that we talked about. Go for some, um, some diversity. Um, so you could be targeting younger people as like, okay, what if your, your aim was your group was um, graduating high school seniors before they go off to college? Now, that may not be the first program that you want to hold because it's not the easiest group to bring in, but maybe start testing it with some of your older folks. And if you have a pre-existing group that's feeding, um, maybe there's an, a group that comes in on Wednesday afternoons for lunch. Maybe that's the program that you want to start with there. Margaret wants to know, is the idea to present a sermon and then follow up with workshops? You know, I think that that's a way that has worked very successfully in many congregations where there's been some uh, promotion ahead of time, uh, notices with a newsletter on your website or announcements before the services that we will be having this workshop it's scheduled for this time. We're encouraging people to register for it. And then either that day or the week or two weeks before the actual workshop, there is the sermon. Um, we have seen it. Uh, I've gone as a guest preacher uh, occasionally where I've preached that day and then immediately done a workshop afterwards. And generally speaking, people will tell me, well, we had a pre-registration of number X, and then 20 more people showed up because they came as a result of the sermon. So you could schedule it that way. I think sometimes with the sermon on a topic like this, having a container for some kind of a conversation afterwards is useful. So even if there's not an actual workshop immediately afterwards, there could either be, um, if it's common in your community to have a sermon talk back, or that there will be uh, a room set aside so people can bring, get their coffee and then come and sit and talk. There'll be a facilitated conversation. But starting right in with a workshop and scheduling it that way is a great way to go. So Catherine, we have a lot of information. She's asking what materials and handouts would be needed to distribute to the attendees at a Conversation Sabbath event. It all depends on how you want to structure that. And we hope that you will take a careful look at our Getting Started Guide. And also, we have information on how to run a Conversation Starter Kit workshop. What we've seen is that at some Conversation Sabbath events, there is the usual order of service or bulletin for folks. And then an insert into the that or on each seat was also a starter kit was handed out. Or the one pager, we have a one page summary to so give people an idea of what goes on in a conversation. Or you might have some, just some um, web links in your order of service to find more information. Here's information about the conversation project on how to download your starter kit. Or here's a link to our state's um, proxy information and advanced care planning documents. Each state is a little bit different, so you would want to put your particular link in. There are a variety of ways that you can have um, think about what kind of handouts and materials you would want to have. 
And this will go also to, we'll talk next week about pastoral care and the idea of creating a library of um, materials that you can direct people to in your congregation, either digitally or print. Um, so it could also be like, we've had this sermon and we've also created these resources for you or here's where we can direct you to resources. So we'll talk more about that, how that could be created at your in your setting. Ultimately, what we're hoping by presenting these different chapters of how to create change in your congregations, you'll see by our final session how you can weave all these things together. So the idea of the preaching happens, but programming happens and pastoral care happens. How do we weave all those things together? Carolyn's letting us know that an attorney in my church cited a situation where a young adult was in a coma and no proxy had been designated and the difficulty in making decisions. Parents did not have a legal right in this situation, so it would be go to probate, for example. Carolyn, you are lifting up one of our major concerns and one of those things that doesn't get talked about very much because it's hard to talk about or even imagine our young children being in this situation. But if someone is over 18, their parents are not automatically, uh, they do not have access to all their health care information because this is person is considered an adult. So that young adult has got to assign someone who is their health care proxy. They can name their parents, so their parents could have a legal right in that situation. That's very, very painful and very, very sad. Okay, so we're posting again for you some other references to the stories that we talked about earlier. And those are just a few. We would love to hear from you uh, if you have had a favorite story. Again, thank you for those that did chime in uh, with stories, with biblical texts. Um, if you have a favorite poem that you have like to use uh, when you're talking about this topic or cite or quote, it's an opportunity for all teach and all learn. Really, we are always trying to collate more resources for folks. And by being on this webinar, you have an opportunity to be part of that learning. Please feel free to keep chatting in with your questions or comments. You can also go to our website and go through some of our post, uh, our blog posts. Those are also filled with stories from people about why they chose to have this conversation. I know that we, um, a couple of years ago when we were doing Conversation Sabbath, two of the people that helped organize Conversation Sabbath in their congregations were lay people. And they did it out of their own experiences, their own stories. Uh, both were young folks. One was a woman who was a very adventurous rock climber who suffered a terrible fall um, that led to uh, loss of a limb and a long recovery and then subsequent health problems that almost killed her. And then she realized, oh my goodness, I never had this conversation. I never made these plans. And she thought when after she recovered, she brought this to her congregation and said, I want to help us help more people be better prepared than I was so that you don't end up in a situation where your family doesn't know and you can't communicate. It doesn't matter how old you are or how healthy you are when you walk out the door. Please have these conversations and don't leave your family in the dark about your wishes. And the same was true of another young woman who uh, had a very difficult delivery and she it drove her to care very deeply about how we talk about these ideas to understand that our lives are precious. We don't know. We don't want to walk around with a cloud over our head all the time, but this is a possibility of being prepared and having the chance to preserve your voice and your choice. And when we talk about it in our faith communities, we also have a place to ground that conversation in our values and our ethics and to learn more about what our traditions actually teach that can support that decision making. So going forward, friends, um, I would like to 
encourage you to a place of action and accountability. I know you're eager to get started in your congregations. Planning is a big part of it. So please continue thinking about text uh, as a way to ground a sermon. Having that prepared ahead of time, just having some references to go to, just kind of takes the edge off uh, during that week when that sermon actually has to be written. What stories or poems, what hymns, what songs, as well as sacred texts could be used. Thanks, Ted Karp just texted in another story, the story of Barrington Bunny from The Way of the Wolf, The Gospel in New Images by Martin Bell. It's good for family services as the way to start a conversation. Thanks, the family stories are always very helpful. Believe it or not, we have heard about the conversation being introduced to um, in high schools where uh, juniors and seniors are being trained to be hospice volunteers. And so they start talking about this in one school in Hawaii at the Iolani School. Iolani school. Um, juniors and seniors who are preparing to be hospice volunteers at the end of the year have to do a service project. And what they decided collectively was that they wish they had started talking about this very deep and meaningful topic much younger. And when the teacher said, how much younger, they said, oh, second grade would have been good. That would have helped normalize it. And so they created a project where they brought the conversation in an age-appropriate way to their second graders with the approval of the faculty and the parents of both the teenagers and the second graders. It was pretty inspiring. In preparing for our next call, we'll be talking about pastoral care and what it means in your context and how advanced care planning or the conversation project will fit into your ideas about what constitutes pastoral care. So to prepare for that, one of our conversation uh, starter kits, we have two start conversation starter kits that are additionally helpful in pastoral care. And we encourage you to just use the website to go find them this time. There's one for families in which a member has Alzheimer's or disease or dementia. And there's also um, one on how to be and how to choose a healthcare proxy. And I'm going to add one more in, which is uh, there is a pediatric kit, a, um, a conversation starter guide for talking with children who have life-limiting illness. So please practice using our website surf around, find our resources, but in particular, preparing for our next call, please take a look at those three starter kits and review them and see what kinds of questions are being framed and consider how they might be useful as pastoral care aids in your setting. Our next session, which is on pastoral care, will be next Tuesday, May 8th, 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. We are very pleased that the Reverend Gloria White Hammond, who is both a physician and a minister, will be joining us on that call to have a conversation with you uh, about pastoral care and how the conversation project, advanced care planning, and having serious illness conversations in your congregations, um, how that goes in her setting and to answer your questions. I remind you that before shutting down your computer tonight, Please complete the survey that will pop up at the conclusion of this call. Your feedback about the content and delivery is very important for our learning and our improvement. So thank you all. I hope you have a beautiful week. I'll close the slides with this one phrase from the Phil Oak song, When I'm Gone. Appreciating every moment, delighted to be with you all, grateful for you and all the work that you're doing to serve so many. Thank you all. Have a good night. Goodbye.
Friends, just a reminder, if you click out, you use the X at the top of your screen and click off, that will take you away from this webinar and the survey will pop up after you close out of this session. Thanks everyone. Good night.